Yeah, sorry, trying to zoom. You can in. see like my cholesterol and stuff. So I'm on six. So I'm on two milligrams of growth hormone. My cholesterol is pretty good. You can see, yeah. I mean, my A1C is a five, and I'm a gun. I'm on six units of growth. I've never used insulin in my life, nor would I. All, all right, I think we're we're rolling here now. We got a got a new new uh, visitor with us this week. It's DJ. Welcome, welcome to the show, Coach DJ. Happy to have you on. Thank you for having me. Kurt, Justin, thanks for joining again. Yeah. I thought we would have yeah. a little bit of fun. We were chatting beforehand, but I thought we would maybe open up with like, I got some Father's Day gifts I was going to share with everybody oh. out there. Maybe if you guys have any that come to mind, but <laughs> I always get a funny shirt. So this is the first one that says, this is not a drill. So I thought you guys would like that. I get all kinds of, what are the, What was the other one I had from last year? This is, uh, it's, oh, it's not a dad bod, it's a father figure. So I have that shirt as well. And then... Dad jokes is how I roll, like E-Y-E-R-O-L-L. -L. That's another one I got. Jeez. <laughs> and then this is not, for all the audience that knows I've been getting beat up in jujitsu. this is not what some people may think it is. It's a jujitsu practice <laughs> dummy, so it's not the, uh, not the other thing. But so I get the, my wife and daughters got sick of me going, come here, I learned something new. Let me show you. They're like, no, 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 no. So, <laughs> so I had a pretty eventful, fun Father's Day weekend and gifts. But other than that, um, my daughters go, why are we working? It's Father's Day. And my wife looks and goes, because it's Father's Day. It's what your dad wants to do. He wants you to help work. So we, we unloaded about a 1,000 cases of some product and made a whole crap ton of samples for people that we're going to get out this week. So pretty excited for that. And then when I had to tell the girls I'm going to pay them, you know, like, I don't know, five bucks an hour or something, they're like, really? It's cool. So the complaining stopped once they knew money was involved. Because at first, they're like, you are we going to pay this? What's that? You pay big. I give my kids like a quarter for, for, for jobs. <laughs> I, it was a slippery slope. And then once they learned the value of money, like that was the whole thing when they're young, we're trying to teach them like how it works. And then once they learned it, they start negotiating. And then finally I'm like, <laughs> I don't have time to negotiate like five bucks. Take it or leave it. So that was my, that's my, any other uh, Father's Day? You were on vacation, DJ, right? Uh, we, we got back on Wednesday, but then we decided to do like a little mini vacation right after because it wasn't fun coming back. So we took, we just took the kids down to a big city and brought them to a hotel and it was, ended up being a disaster. We wanted to take them swimming and we were going to get a cabana and it was all drunk 21 year olds crammed in the pool, like sardines, like rooftop pools in Dallas. Terrible idea. I don't know why I thought that would be kid friendly so we just had the bar make them like little mocktails and they had shirley temples and ran around like crazy around the hotel in their pajamas for, for hours nice it was nice now now we're back 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 to the work day on monday after vacation yeah it's pretty drowning justin how about you uh just super laid back uh my son's actually playing a super nintendo uh it's like a uh I guess it's a smart version it's where they have all the games loaded into it. He's in there right now, but I just uh, smoked some wings and we kind of just hung out and um, so I'm still moving. So uh, put together his trampoline, just typical dad stuff around the house. Good deal. I just took, we belong to a lake that's like literally behind my house. I just took my kids there. My son fishes. Nice. Back there, my daughter just laid in the sun. How old are you kiddos again? Uh, my daughter just turned 14 this past weekend. Cool. My son just turned nine. So. Yeah, mine are nine. Different stuff. Yeah, mine are nine and twelve. So yeah, okay. similar, somewhat similar. But <laughs> all right, well, we'll get into the fun stuff. I think we were, we can start anywhere, go any, go everywhere. But yeah. um, I think we were originally kicking off maybe some some talking points about uh, blood work and start very basic, and then we can go wherever. But I think just to kind of set it up was. We've been seeing some questions and, and and things around, you know, the difference between like normal, kind of natural. I'm on TRT. I'm using PEDs and PED type dosing. What are some basic markers I should watch and why? And then what are maybe as it progresses, like maybe some more advanced markers that I should be requesting and or looking at and why? And so we can kind of I'll lay the table for that. It's a lot, a lot there, but wherever you guys would like to start or whoever wants to kick it off, I thought I would open up with some of the, some of those thoughts go from there. I was just going to preface it with saying, so I work with guys at all different levels from natural to, I have a ton of guys that are in TRT or some sort of <laughs> very low dose, something to big pros that use a lot of stuff. And I'll tell you, I don't see a ton of variation in blood work. 
I think a lot of it's genetic or just mm-hmm. lifestyle factors. Mm-hmm. Even the guys, like even the guys using five, six grams a gear, you don't generally see things that far off. I mean, clearly their testosterone levels are very high up and their HDL mm-hmm. might be reduced, but I don't see a ton of troubling stuff. I see troubling stuff in other people that have things wrong with them, but not um, not always steroid directly related. That was in English related directly to steroid. Um, that's at least that's at least in my experience. Now, I'm not, and I'm not implying that steroids are safe. That wasn't like a it wasn't a suggestion that everyone should just do grams of gear. I think you make a good point. Is if you are dysfunctional, bringing in drugs into a dysfunctional state, you could potentially see some of those other issues. Usually when somebody's pretty healthy and has a pretty good diet, in my experience, probably some genetic factors as well. Uh, they tend to handle and do better with different drugs. Um, I do think personally, some drugs do impact things like cholesterol, uh, obviously liver and kidney, specifically oral steroids, you know, I'll just kind of throw that out there. Those seem to be the most detrimental in health profiles. Uh, injectables for the most part uh, seem much more tolerated for most people. Yeah, that's, I typically, again, gigantic pro bodybuilders, different topic. I typically have guys avoid orals. I don't think there's anything that oral steroids are doing for men that you couldn't get in an injectable done better without risking your health, right? Your kidneys, your liver, your stomach. Like you see that in guys like, some of the pros that have been doing drugs for a long time, their stomachs are all screwed up from taking pills. Um, I think one of the, the biggest issues we see, and unfortunately this message can only reach like 10% of the demographics because most people don't pay attention to blood work until something has already occurred or they've already started, but baseline lab work, like that's really important for anyone yeah. because like you had mentioned, a lot of when we do see skewed data or, or skewed markers, it's not always a direct result of the compound, but these are typically unhealthy demographics to begin with that maybe don't have those lifestyle choices dialed in. It's related to nutrition and activity levels, but they lack the baseline lab work. And then six months into their beginner trend cycles there, they're going to pull their labs and then they start to see that their markers are off. And then the yep. immediately, the immediately blame the anabolics, of course, but baseline labs can kind of give you a good indication of what you may or may not be a candidate for. Yeah. And scans, organ scans too. Like I, you and I, DJ have talked about before. I have one kidney. I was born with one kidney. I didn't learn that until I was 39 and that oh, wasn't wow. picked up in lab. I just sent Joe, on a sudden, I just sent Joe my most recent lab so you can see, and I'll be transparent about what I was using there, but you can see my labs are pretty freaking good. And I'm on, I'm definitely on gear in this. Um, but I took my name off of it. So it's not on the internet with like a photograph with my name on it. Um, uh, but what was I going to say? Um, what was I just saying to you? About your kidney and not being organ able scans. to be picked up on lab. Uh, organ yeah, scans. baseline. Yeah. I mean, it's... You, you definitely need to have some sort of baseline because you might pick up something that's super unhealthy that has nothing to do with steroids, right? Steroids might magnify that issue. And if you're not aware of it, right, it could be too late. So like, I'm always sure. aware of things like paying attention to my kidney to make sure that it's not, I'm not putting under stress. Like I'm not the guy who's going to run tons of Anavar or something that might directly stress it. That's interesting. I actually worked in an uh, HRT setting with a, a patient of the clinics and he had uh some sort of carcinoma on his kidney and one of them were, were, was removed and his EGR, EGFR was actually very low. And I didn't know if that was due to him having a signal kidney or if there's filtration issues because he didn't have any labs present. But yeah, he wasn't very mus- muscular. Okay. So like muscular. mine is, so you can post, I send them to you so you can put them up if you want. I'm okay. Sure. Yep. Just okay. so I'm on, on these labs, I'm on 600 milligrams of testosterone and two or 300 milligrams of premium volume an f8 and this episode is brought to you by first attachment first attachment is an expert formulated supplement company founded by renowned coach justin harris we've combined science with real world experience in each product we are battle tested are you find your battle today at firstattachment.com and six units of serostim growth hormone no ai i don't know if you can yeah, sorry, trying to zoom. You can see like my cholesterol and stuff. So I'm on six, so I'm on two milligrams of growth hormone. My cholesterol is pretty good. 
118, that's pretty good, you know. Uh, total cholesterol, HDL still in the 40s. HDL is Yeah, man, that's uh, really impressive. I'm on uh, a well, lot you, less anabolics in my lipids. I think genetically are not very, yeah, uh, very good. Genetic. You, can see, <laughs> you can tell I'm on primobolin because my free test is half of my total. That's one of like the telltale sons of primo is that my free test is a 727. Interesting. Yeah, these look, are these recent? Or is this what you're what you're doing recent, now? Yeah, recent. Oops, sorry. Hold on. Let me pull up this other one. Are you in prep What's right it? now? Me? No, I'm not going to compete anymore. Yeah, but, you didn't give me that update. <laughs> I remember there, you guys were that. talking about potential show dates. Yeah, I think I've given up on that. I think Kurt, can't, my, my calling is in helping other people. I think at this you point, you and I are in the same boat. Yeah. I just avoided a a relatively major surgery myself. I'll tell you that story later. You can see, yeah. I mean, my A1C is a five, and I'm a gun. I'm on six units of growth. I've never used insulin in my life, nor would I. But again, that's from being lean. Like my doctor was like, "That's because you don't eat." I'm like, "No, I'm eating like a thousand grams of carbs." He's like, "No, it's because you don't eat. You're not listening to me. That's I eat a lot of food. That's just because I'm not fat." Yeah, I think you're, what you're fasting was 77, was it? Yeah. yeah. I know. Well, before growth hormone, I used to go hypo. The growth hormone has got to help me like keep my blood sugar at a whopping 77 so I don't pass let out. See. Let me see where that is. Here we go. Yeah. Do, 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 do. Well. do you use any like um, any sort of prophylactics for uh, – really? That's I'm on no medicine. Very good. I, outside of – Outside of the the steroids, I've done nothing. I've never taken blood pressure medicine. I've never taken anything for blood sugar. That's why when guys ask me about using insulin, I'm like, it would kill me. Literally, it would kill me. You picked the right parents, Kurt. I think you got pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you stored me on a kidney, though. So where did you get My EGFR is a 74. I have one kidney and on steroids, and I have yeah. And I'm two ten at five foot seven, so I have a significant amount of mass. So it's not horrible. It's not great, but the one organ's doing its job. Alkaline FOS is kind of low. Yeah, um, medium was low. It's interesting. I've also looked a lot in like uh, GI function and sometimes not having enough uh, stomach acid can lower alkaline FOS as well. Do you have any digestive issues? No, when I raised my magnesium, it seemed to have improved. I have one more labs that I just didn't get fully back yet. I can, I'll, I can, we can post them next week. But when I raised my magnesium, that number changed. If it's a GI issue, Justin, what would corrective action look like for that? Well, I would probably do some sort of GI testing uh, to see if it's an issue with uh, some sort of bacteria. For me, I, I always had a low alkaline FOS and I would supplement zinc, I'd supplement magnesium, um, but getting enough things like uh, support to break down protein, biotine, pepsin, uh, Apple cider vinegar can be helpful as well. Things to help break down food. Uh, that's the only thing to actually take my alkaline FOS from low to like a normal range. And I never understood that because uh, from like 12 years old, as I would always have acid reflux. Uh, but I just think probably uh, excessive amounts of antibiotics as a kid. I think we're supposed to be exposed to antibiotics five times in our life. And I could confidently say I've probably had antibiotics 10 or 15 times in my life. The other interesting thing, if you do something like a, a GI mapping and you, uh, it'll show you the particular types of antibiotics that you have resistance to. So if you're trying to cl clear up H pylori or something, it'll show you the strands that will not work for you. So if you're like, Hey, I want to go to the doctor and fix this. You can take them that and be like, Hey, these three obviously aren't going to work. You can look at using these other type of antibiotics to correct that issue. I really like that test. I think it's super helpful. I think everything kind of originates in the gut. Justin, can you write for that? No, no. no I, I have a provider who does. Okay, I might reach out to you. I've never, it's not something we're taught. I'd be kind of interested to see what. It's yeah, super we, cool. We have it. We have it too. Uh, oh, you do? Okay. A new company has it, but okay. actually Justin's uh, okay. 
going to help with uh, some of the interpretation stuff. But I should have worn my first attachment stuff. I got your sweatshirt and a hat. I got it on. on. It's all good. I, it's I, all I good. Get on the call and I didn't have time to put on my Superman. <laughs> How's it fit? That's that's more important. Everything's perfect. Everything's perfect. It's good. All right. I'm yeah. always. I'm not the uh, size guy, right? So I'm like asking people three times, like, "What size?" I got one more. The panel. DJ texted me and I was like, "Oops, got to give him a call." All good. All good. Yeah, this is the insulin, right? Yeah. I need to zoom. It was at a five, five point five. Yeah, five point five. I mean, That's again, pretty good. I, I'm not a thousand it's, grams of carbs. Mine would be like, like a twenty. Yeah, and this is my specialty, and I can be honest with you, I'm not sure as long as it's within range what it really is telling anyone anyway, because it's gonna move. I think yeah. it depends on like how long you go without food. You know, if okay. you, you should do a twelve hour fast. Um, I've I seen stopped like, eating the night before. That was it. That's about as long as I can go. I'm a mess if I go much longer than that. But I think that's a that's a huge factor in, in interpretation as well, because so many people don't understand what steps they need to take when they're pulling blood work. And it's not just for our enhanced athletes and timing at specific levels or in correlation to specific injections or HRT, just general population you know, I'll have people that do their labs in the middle of the day because it's convenient. So they'll go eat lunch on their lunch break and then run to the lab. And then I'm horrified when I look at the results until I ask them. But that's also a communication uh, gap that we see that frequently needs to be bridged between providers and patients is they're not asking for the details just because a lab order or lab requisition form gives instructions, which frequently they do not, still doesn't mean the patient's going to follow it. And they're not going to go to their follow-up appointment and say, oh, by the way, I had taken this right before dinner after a full day's of eating. Um, and it, we can look at even things like cortisol readings, insulin. Those are all going to look skewed based on timing. And most people do not pay attention to that or know that they're supposed to be fasted in the morning, but still hydrated. No, I, I think just, you make oh, go ahead. a good point, DJ, is like the, uh, especially red blood cells when we're trying to track something like that. I always ask guys, I'm like, well, you know, your RBCs are a little elevated. He's like, I had a cup of black coffee. I didn't drink any water yesterday and I worked out. I'm like, well, that could be potentially why those are high. I'll look at creatinine, I'll look at EGFR. Those are also going to move based off hydration. So I think having people understand it's very important to follow the procedures with labs because it, it gives a better outline of what is going to be interpreted. As, like, when I first started doing labs, I would just do them whenever because I, I wanted to get on treatment or I needed to go to the doctor, so I didn't care. So I just went and did them, and it doesn't give a clear depiction of what's going on. And I pass out, so I want to go in in a very, very <laughs> well-fed state. <so. laughs> well, I was recently looking at my brothers, and uh, he's um, diabetic, but like getting – you know, pretty low on it, the insulin um, that he's taking. So I was, just, I was just interested. And I was like, wait a minute. Like his fasting glucose was like 350 or something. I was like, you took this fasted? I was like, how are you managing it? Because he had some life changes to where he wasn't managing it as well. And he goes, he's like, yeah, yeah, I fasted. And I said the number. And he goes, well, I mean, I put sugar in my coffee. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> like that is like the number one thing not to do. Oh, okay, okay. I'm like, never mind. <laughs> like, did your doctor say anything about that? Like, you clearly are not fast in this in this panel, but it all worked out because it was more to check his some of his hormones and stuff. I mean, I think he's 46 and was just trying to see, like, you know, uh, hasn't been the healthiest the last 15 years or whatever. He's been really getting back into it, uh, healthy and whatnot. So. I think he was just trying to check it, but it was just like, yeah, follow the instructions. This isn't a suggestion. <laughs> I can't, I can't preach the importance of that enough because now, especially within like the coaching realm and the, working with enhanced athletes, it's this very blurred line where it's subjective data. And uh, some people may say, Hey, it's fine. I worked out hard a couple of days before I did deadlifts and I, I wasn't well hydrated and you have to trust their opinion on that that biofeedback and a lot of times markers are going to be ignored or they're going to be justified and being in poor ranges because someone will claim it's just because I wasn't hydrated when we don't actually know that so following instructions is very important because that interpretation becomes uh it's subjective at that point. And I've had people where I know that there are issues based on their baseline blood work and differences in you know, genetic components, there, mm -hmm. lifestyle choices. I know there's issues and they say, oh, well, I lifted really heavy the day before. And I'm like, I've seen you in the gym. You didn't. 
You didn't. That doesn't, it's yeah, just poor life now towards this. Doesn't explain why your EGFR is 20. I'm like, it's not because you deadlifted. <laughs> it was the because deadlift. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, I was going to ask um, a couple of follow-ups. One was, and I might butcher this, but I, I believe it was a speaker I heard say this, and Justin, we may have been working together when this topic came up, but it was talking about the using like the, it was the five-point glucose tolerance test and then running like the insulin test with it during the five points. And by all means, it's not my content or information, so feel free to correct it. But they were essentially saying the, the glucose tolerance test might come back good, like your response, but you may in the background see that insulin is just going absolutely bonkers to try to maintain that glucose. And that is another layer of looking deeper to see if you're on the way to having you know issues with blood sugar management in the near future. I don't know if there's the validity in that, uh, if you guys have seen that, or if that makes yeah, sense well, with science. Insulin is biphasic. The response to carbohydrates is always like so multiple phases. It's, whereas like protein, you, you weigh protein, your insulin will spike, but it's monophasic. And then the pancreas will go the other way, right? Because there's no glucose made. So you should see, you should see that, but what you're probably, what I guess he's referring to is that the glucose wasn't going down with the insulin going up. That's where it's scary, right? Because then it's not going into the cell. Mm -hmm. That's where yeah, it's that, dangerous. It's not the insulin response. You want to see that insulin response. Right. No, that makes sense. Glucose. I think that exactly. Yeah, that clarifies it because it was. If a, this is going up and this is going, right. you know, that's terrifying. Yeah. Because it it's literally can't go anywhere. Have and that's you, because insulin resistance. The pancreas will stop just kicking out insulin at a certain point because it's not responding. Yeah, that was, a, it was an OB we used to work with and she, I always called her a glucose goddess because she was obsessed with tracking glucose and insulin and giving metformin. But I've looked at several of those uh, five point glucose tests and uh, being able to kind of track that data over time. So you do um, fasted, fed, so they give you the, the dextrose drink and then they'll track it for another hour and a half. Um, I think it's helpful information because sometimes we can see fasting glucose may be very low and fasting insulin may be low but when we feed we may have abnormalities with that and uh, you could see higher levels of glucose postprandial and then you're keeping that you know plasma glucose plasma insulin high for a period of time throughout the day uh, maybe could correlate to why your hemoglobin a1c is an eight but your fasting insulin and glucose look good yeah no it makes sense you're fasting what did you very little most of the time do you ever look at like a c peptide kurt like it's something i hear people talking about i never really looked at it in like a clinical setting and uh with any providers but i hear some prep coaches talking about looking at c peptide and was just curious if you had any insight on that i mean to see like an elevation that like this inflammation occurring because of high of insulin like high blood sugar i mean yeah. I, I look at it sometimes but i generally don't see it like with bodybuilders, you know, I don't see it with that. I generally see it from other stuff like bad gear, dirty oil, you know, or shitty food, too much food, like just overall stress on the body more. So like you could see it though, with some level of diabetes in a clinical setting, it'd just be from a different cause. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I think all the numbers on labs have value. You just need to, it's like a big puzzle, right? Like you start and then you kind of look. Like when I look at thyroid, then I look at other hormones. I don't just put thyroid. Like I don't look at anything as an individual marker. Right. They're all referenced back to each other, right? Like why? And just what like you did before with ALP. Like it might not be ALP. Like that enzyme's everywhere. Does it mean it has anything to do with your liver? Probably not, right? It could be a million things that could be causing that to be off. Same with thyroid. Thyroid is a great one because thyroid can be off from lots of things. It doesn't mean that it's right. an actual thyroid that's off. We would talk a lot in clinical setting with a provider and she'd always check prolactin because we're looking at uh, the hypothalamus or the pituitary. One of them mm -hmm. could potentially interact with uh, thyroid releasing hormone. And sometimes we'd see an elevated prolactin of like 30 or 40. She would give docinex or something similar, dopamine agonist. And mm -hmm. their TSH sometimes, not always, would fall back in line. So it's really interesting. Men or women? Of, both. Both. I, okay. Surprisingly, men, both. In men, so men in prolactin, prolactin will only elevate if thyroid is down, thyroid function is down, right? Or estrogen is up. So we see it a lot in bodybuilders now because everyone runs their estrogen really high. You get a lot of guys that have their prolactin high. And as soon as you bring their estrogen back into range, the prolactin 
goes away. The mm -hmm. only time you see it is an adenema, like a non-cancerous something pushing on the pituitary, but that's not that common. Usually you can check IGF. If IGF is really high, then it's most likely that something wrong with the pituitary. I, you're right. I've only seen it. You know, I probably last year I helped 350 people in a medical setting. Uh, and I, one out of one out of 50 probably have an adenome, maybe one out of a hundred. Yeah. It's not that common. And it depends on the severity. Like I've seen prolactins in the hundreds and then sometimes it may be like 15 or 20. And none of those other markers are skewed. So they go in and have an exam and have some sort of microadenoma. It depends on what part of the pituitary it's pushing on too. It can cause all sorts of problems. It can cause an adrenal problem, but it's really up here that's causing the yeah. issue. But like if it's pushing on that specific part, a lot of times you'll see, like when I've seen it, you'll see IGF will be really high, like 1100. Right, but they, ha they have their testosterone. Then the next thing I look at is testosterone because then I want to know if they're doing drugs. Oh, my thing froze again. Um, give a thumbs up. <laughs> give a thumbs up. Um, you know, I'll look at other things to to see what's actually occurring there. And like the testosterone is like a 300, but their IGF is 1100, right? And then you look at things like prolactin and that's up too, which, you know, unless. In a clinical setting, how often are you pulling prolactin or is that going to be standard for your initial lab assessment with a patient? I think it depends on the clinic. Some clinics don't pull anything. They just want to sell you testosterone. Uh, but the, the clinic I worked at had a pretty good panel. Um, I would say it's good to look at baseline if, you're, if you've if you never done anything and you're wanting to do hormone replacement therapy. Prolactin is probably an essential piece. It is uh, can be an endocrine disruptor if it's elevated, especially in women. I think prolactin is something that's highly underlooked in uh, female reproductive fertility context. Uh, prolactin is going to halt fertility. It's going to suppress hormones. Uh, it's a, it's an important piece in my opinion, but if it's low once it's in, if it's elevated later, it's probably induced by drugs or hormones like Kurt saying. So I think it's only good to really look at it one time to see if it's an issue. I do the same thing. I do a lot of those one time. I find a lot of like, I deal with mostly men. A lot of men get really distracted with these obscure things and they obsess about them. They're like, my sex hormone binding globulin is a 13. Like, <laughs> I don't care what your sex hormone binding globulin is, but my penis doesn't work. It's not related to your sex hormone binding globulin. Let's freak. So a lot of times I won't even write for those ones. I don't want to see them unless I need to see it because I know that it's just going to move with other numbers, right? Like I want to see estrogen. I want to see free test. I want to see like DHT is irrelevant. I want to see... It's really just those prolactin, same thing. I'll check once. I'm just curious where it is on someone, but I don't need to see it ever again, unless they start lactating or something weird is like occurring. But it's like never, guys always want to blame that, right? Guys use DECA and they want to blame prolactin. So it's not prolactin. Right. Don't be taking caber just because you, you think that that's a I see that so like caber is atrocious. Automatically take caber. one more DECA. Be like, what? Yeah, <laughs> like Get your estrogen under control. What is what yeah. is usually like out of range that that you guys are seeing out there? Because I've seen. Uh, well, I'll just ask the question, then maybe add more. But like for prolactin, like how how high is I concerning? Have, I had one I think yesterday. I was in his forties. I've seen as high as hundreds with cancer. Sure, um, fifteen should be abnormal for men. I think like fifteen point six. But LabCorp actually changes their reference range. They increase the range. For I've seen it go up to 20 on a reference range. And usually, again, over 15, 15 is kind of a, a cutoff, but a lot of them have increased the reference ranges, a lot of them. And, and I've seen them at 20 as a baseline. Lowering their testosterone reference. Dude, ranges. every year. When I first started working in uh, hormone replacement, it was a 1,200. Now it's a 916. I'm like, come on. like it, You can't keep dropping the testosterone rating. The interesting thing is Canada has a larger range. Their range goes much higher specifically for women. So uh, like 10 or 15 points. Yeah. So I had one yesterday. Just I was just, that's what I was looking at. I had a guy yesterday, his prolactin was a 31, but his estrogen was a 115 sensitive. So it's, I was like, we need to get your estrogen down. He's like, is that high? I was like, well, if you're ovulating, it's not high. <laughs> He's like, I can't ovulate. Exactly. Let's get that in range. <laughs> I think there's just the common way. sense. You know, well, it's like kind of check check off the boxes of what's going on, and, and then start making it. assessment. Yeah, I agree with my, you. My, I, I, sh I, I should start doing a podcast with my wife because she's not in this industry at all, nor does she care about any of this stuff. But she's the first one to be like, I just don't understand why a man will want to have high estrogen. 
Like it just like common sense is like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. You know, and then guys justify it all day long. Like it's not doing what you think it's doing. Well, and I think you make a good point is like, sometimes you do need an aromatase inhibitor. If you are, if you're trying to mitigate the symptoms, like I'll be put myself out there right now. It's like, I've been escalating testosterone and my weight was going up and I was getting smoother. And I was like, man, I'm just going to throw in half a milligram of Rimidex for seven days later, reassess. It completely pulled all the water off of me. Yeah. My nipple was getting a little sensitive. It's just, it kind of makes sense to like, one, you should log what you're doing. Like if you're going to use yeah. drugs, you should keep yeah. a, keep track of what you're doing and then kind of be able to compare that data over time. Yeah. I'm a huge proponent. I'm basically a soundboard for a lot of guys. I have all these sheets and they'll come in and we'll kind of look at their drugs and like I'm having these symptoms and I'll review all that information and be like, well, it's probably X, Y, or Z. And that's why you keep a log. Yeah. Yeah. And just fast for anyone who's not, who doesn't watch any of the other 8 million times I've said it, what estrogen in men is not directly anabolic at all. It only contributes to glycogen storage. It has no effect on muscle tissue in men. With IGF, it is a it is a limiting factor. It's a binding, making it useless. It's not increasing it. Increased IGF and serum is not doing what bodybuilders want to do. That has nothing to do with building muscle. That has to go into a muscle cell first to be spliced to MGF in order to work. So having high IGF and serum is not a bodybuilding trait that you're looking for. It's And, and the risk factors are cancer of having high estrogen. It's not a joke. Prostate cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, it happens in men. We have all sorts of things can go wrong with high estrogen. Arimidex has been proven safe for over 40 years, and it's actually used as an anti-cancer drug. It's not going to cause harm. If The studies that show that it's harm are not in men. There's no PubMed studies to show that Arimidex is causing harm or cardiovascular disease. That stuff is fabricated. Crunch you and I had looked at one that was, yeah. what, the data was on 75-year-old women, and that was the study that was being cited by everyone as and why you can't take you Arimidex. A woman's estrogen. If a woman has breast cancer that's estrogen dependent, you have to crush their estrogen. That's not what we're doing here. That's not our goal. I'm not, I've never once told a guy to crush his estrogen outside of maybe last week of a show prep, but it's not, that's different. I, you want it in range because that's really where it's optimal. You, that's, you just want your body to work correctly. In nature, men's estrogen would never be elevated. It's just not a situation you'd see unless there's something seriously wrong with them. I'm appalled at some of the estrogen management trends in, in general and why, why there's even the potential for division on that. I don't even know how that's open to because, DJ, opinions. It's so, it, but how many people in our space are educated in this, in this stuff? There's a they handful. All watch There's enough people giving protocols to where they well, should be. <laughs> time, we feel like, but they want to debate and they have a high school diploma. And I said this in, a, in my stories. I posted something in my stories the other day. Like I had been asked for the hundredth time that day on Father's Day about one of those silly things that I posted. It was probably about using telmosartan to control water from estrogen. And it was like, I'm over this. It's, it's really ridiculous at this point that there are guys that the last science class they took was in the ninth grade. And then they want to play games of people's health. And make advice as to how to prophylactically use blood pressure medicine. I, yeah, I, I don't want, I mean, it's one of my pet peeves. I think it's because when I was in school, we had to, I got pounded on how to read research, how to cite it, how to know the validity of the research. So it's like this PTSD I have. So it, it shouldn't drive me nuts, but it does when like some influencer posts a study and then you go digging and you're like, did you look at the control group? Did you look at they the look the like the conclude? It's not even the highest level of research. You know what I mean? It's like some random person just put a paper, like posted something like, like the Anavar one with the belly fat. Right. I mean, they're all like that. People take these, like they cherry pick what they're looking for. Right, they right. Have you have the I think part of the problem is half the people don't have access to the studies. It's like where we can actually go into PubMed and read the study. Right. If you're reading the abstract, and I get it, if you're not, we've all had to take classes too in how to read studies, like you just said. Right. I, that was the first class I had to take, was like how to interpret a study. And you have to know calculus. So you have people with no science background, no math background, and then they're trying to interpret a study based on an abstract that doesn't make any sense, right? Or it's not even in humans, it's in animals. And they're trying to translate it to people, right? Like the, the Anavar one is ridiculous. Like guys like Anavar burns belly fat. Well, the control group was obese old men and they paired it against testosterone and anthate, but the testosterone and anthate was administered one shot every three weeks. Well, clearly that's not the right way to give test. 
And then they halfway through the study, they dropped the Anavar and switched to DECA. And then DECA made them get fatter. So they just canceled the whole study. So it was like, what did the study even show? But everyone's like, Anavar burns more fat. Based well, we did a full course. video on that. And the yeah. questions were, so I should take Anavar for fat loss? No, <laughs> no. You, steroids are used for build tissue, not for fat loss. But, it's, but that's the stuff that's all day long. That's the problem with this space is that there's no criteria to make these suggestions. Right. I see it with all this stuff. Same with the salt. That's why I post the sodium potassium pump. The amount of people that don't understand which one goes in the cell and which one comes out of the cell. It's it's not that complicated. There's only two options. And, and go eat Chinese food and see what you look like the next day. Right. It's not I think so it's okay to not know. Just don't, don't turn well, the don't camera on and tell people what to do based on your limited knowledge. It's it's even some like I, even some like nurses or medical assistants. I you know I've talked to recently I had a family member that was looking into semi-glutide and they were just reading a chart that said no you can't take it because of this and I was just like well where are you referencing that and then I dug into it myself and I was talking to my family member like well you you actually don't even have that they had a part of the, one of their organs removed and it was a contraindication based on certain cells in that organ growing in rodent studies and I'm like you don't have that organ like they didn't bother to ask any of that and again I deferred this per my family member back to their primary care to be like, Hey, take this study in there, highlight, highlight it, like show and say, can you do this or can't you? And just get a, don't get a yes or no, get it. What's the, what's the why behind it? What's the mechanism of action that's causing the issue or the concern for the contraindication? That's how you want to pin down the doc. And like, I, I love my primary care because, you know, he's just a couple years older than me, but he'll just pull up his stuff and start reading when I'm like saying stuff and it's more of a collaboration versus like, I'm the doc, shut up. You know, it's like, well, you know, and again, that wasn't the case with her primary care, but it was just like along the way of trying to find some help and figure out why you can and can't have help. It's like, slow down and just explain that what's the layer below it. Like, why can't they do this? Um, it's just something recently that irritated me. It was a good reminder, you know, to where I'm like, Oh, <laughs> so, I think you maybe because I didn't want to learn how to read studies and had to for so many hours. <laughs> so that's probably why it's probably my own. Uh, what am I doing? What's the word projecting my own, my yeah. own issues? <laughs> you m make a really good point though, because every doctor is going to have their own prescribing method methods and processes. And uh, I would always recommend somebody when they're looking to do something, if a provider doesn't give you an answer and they cut you off, you're paying them a copay go to a different clinic talk to a different doctor that's the beauty of this they need us we don't need them and that's no knock i i have a great pcp as well but when i when he doesn't know something and i bring him in some some specific piece of literature he says i'll get back to you you know and that's what i like about that type of collaboration versus like no you don't know what you're talking about i've been practicing family medicine for 30 years i'm like well it's great but i know you've only done limited courses on endocrinology as in, it's just very frustrating for the average person to not realize that there is other help that they could get. But I think it goes back to that thing. Get different oh, care as well. We all probably, when our experiences with doctors are probably different than the average person. Like sure. doctors generally will work with me. Like I, yeah, I had to go on a, two sulfa drugs and antibiotic not too long ago. Like I told the doctor what drugs and what dose, and he was like thought about it for a second. He's like, sounds good to me. Right. You know, versus like the average person's going to walk in there and the doctor's just going to look it up. They're not going to have any say in what they do. Yeah, just really just knowing knowing the stuff definitely helps and makes a pretty big uh, pretty big impact on that. I think that's an important role that kind of all of us play is we're definitely not trying to step on toes by any means, but we kind of help bridge that gap that gap in communication between patients and providers. We can kind of tell them how to express specific biofeedback, what they're looking for, and help them kind of shop for a provider. It's ideal to have a patient relationship where you can. Speak to your provider openly and they will do the research. But again, like you mentioned, Justin, they're not all going to be open to that. Not everybody wants to be told or shown that they may be deficient in a specific area and it's not their area of expertise. But even even I've had I've had to refer people to Kurt like for post um, PSSD issues. That is so far out of my scope. And there should be no issue referring someone to somebody that can help them effectively. Yeah, we I think we all refer out. Like I've said, I said, I, you have someone that I sent you, you've had her for mm -hmm. a while. Yeah. Yeah. There's a young kid in, out here that, uh, I want to say is close to, he's over 500 pounds that the mom wanted me to help. And I was just like, 
he's 14. I'm like, let's get him help with like therapy and, you know, here's some basic stuff, like try to feel her. But I was like, I no, <laughs> I, you know, I just wanted him to get, he already had such a negative relationship with food more mentally. I felt like it was a bigger yeah. block than whatever I'm going to suggest he does or have him do. That's going to just not be applicable for him. I'm like, that's not my area of expertise. Like I'm like, you can call, you can text, you can email as much as you want. I don't want a dollar from you. I don't care. Like just help to get out. I'm like, but I'm not like his guy, you know, or person yeah. to oversee it. Like I just, I just knew I wouldn't be the best person for him. I get, you guys probably all get the same. I get, unfortunately, a lot of people who probably need more psychological help or psychiatry help to some degree. And I'm not equipped to do that, right? Like I have a little bit of education in it, but I don't, that's hardly, I didn't spend another 10 years in school to become a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I, you know, but I think it goes hand in hand, I think with fitness, like we're seeing more and more mental things going on. And I think a lot of times they reach out to a coach, like DJ, I'm sure you have clients who have, trust in you right and discuss things that mm -hmm. they should probably be discussing with someone that's I am absolutely not with. the person in my <laughs> no I mean I'm not either that's I feel that. like I, I can understand like I can explain generally the neurotransmitter end of the problem but I can't necessarily come up with a solution yeah. well we were we were kind of going down um a little bit on blood work and markers are there Justin I think you sent over some stuff like testosterone iron is there anything else you wanted to to talk through on blood markers or did you want to move on to some gut health stuff or where, 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 where would you like to take this? Yeah, I was, uh, kind of looking at, uh, iron testosterone replacement therapy and potentially increases in iron due to, um, the liver's ability to reuptake iron. Am I explaining that correctly, Kurt? Mm -hmm. Um, and potentially how that could be a contributing factor to elevations in red blood cells further downstream. Um, that's something that I usually tell people. So kind of back to our initial conversation, if you're going to track basic things from TRT to an enhanced, like re CBC is probably a top tier CMP and then lipids. Those are going to derange as you in increase drugs. If you have the genetics to have sway in those. So if someone asked me, how do I know if I'm taking too much testosterone? Well, your HDL is a 12, your red blood cells are a six or, or higher. Um, you could see specifics like with, um, liver, kidney enzymes elevating or decreasing depending on drug load. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought that uh, the iron piece is really interesting because I feel like unless you're a woman who has PMS, PMDD symptoms, you're probably not really pulling iron and ferritin. It's not something that's really talked about. I, I pull it in my guys because I want to see what, it, but again, like once or twice, not as like a constant. Right, because what's anabolism? So I think people miss this. Like anabolism isn't just muscle tissue. Red blood cells are part of anabolism. That's why half these steroids, they weren't really invented for that, but that's kind of how they got by the FDA with them, right? Anadrol 50, even Primabol, and they tried that with, I, you know, a lot of these drugs are used in the old days before EPO existed for anemia. So that's, mm -hmm. that's kind of how, you know, that's, they're not so selective in their tissue expression and you're producing all these new red blood cells and they're just not the same. They're bigger and they don't have the same oxygen carrying capacity as the original ones. There's generally a swing though. I see unless guys are continually elevating their drugs, generally you'll see it even out right with the red blood cell count and everything kind of levels out over time of using drugs. Like mine doesn't get elevated. Mine does anyway. based off of food, believe it or not. And it goes back to the am animalism piece. It's like, as soon as I get really heavy and food escalates really high, I have to donate. I'm super thick, but I could run a gram, a gram and a half into a show, but I'm really dieted and really lean. I do my labs. Uh, all of my phlebotomy looks really clean. It's more at the tail end of an off season when food is really high. I tend to have more red blood cells. I was, uh, Paul Barnett and I talked about that the other day too. That's the funny like paradox to of blood work when you're a bodybuilder is the assumption is during prep because you're using orals, you might be using Tran. There's a lot of harsher drugs that go into it and you would assume your health would be down the toilet. But a lot of times if you, especially if you carry a ton of weight in the off season, you're unhealthier in the off season running like no injectable anabolics than you are running Winstrol 200 milligrams because you're lean, right? Your body's working better. You're probably doing more cardio, you know, the only thing that's really messed up is sleep tends to be screwed up, but like you're technically your body's functioning better. Yeah, no, I agree with you hundred percent on that is I already have the genetic components of type two diabetes from my mother's side. So as soon as I get up over a certain amount of food, 
I can throw metformin at it. I could put insulin at it. At a certain point, I just have to reduce food because I'm starting to get so inflamed. That's just my genetic makeup. And I think that's why it makes sense to do labs and kind of even get some familial components if you're able to. Mm -hmm. I know some people are unfortunate not to know both of their parents, but if you do get that data, you know, the other thing, not to go too far in a tangent, but even autoimmune disorders, I work with a lot of women. That's kind of my bread and butter. And I look at Hashimoto's and she's like, I have no idea. And I'm like, well, does your mom have a thyroid issue? Yeah. And her mom had a thyroid issue. I'm like, well, you should have looked at this 10 years ago. I'm like, all of these things uh, could be from uh, the familial component. And then we bring in all these environmental lifestyle environmental toxins, lifestyle factors, and now we have this perfect storm for hypothyroidism, autoimmune disorders, uh, issues with red blood cells, if we're going back to male demographic, prostate cancer, you know, all of those things are kind of tied together. When with that, not to go back to estrogen, but the reason why you see Hashimoto's in females and thyroid disorder generally is because of estrogen again. So when guys have this really skewed thyroid stuff, I check their estrogen because a lot of times it's because their estrogen is high. That was one of the conversations we had about the over prescription of exogenous thyroid medication due to TSH Enough. values alone and the mm, relationship between estrogen and right. lack of management. So wrong. Also, I'm a ghost right now. I don't know what happened to my face, but I'm progressively getting wider as we record. <laughs> <laughs> it's vacation fading away. That's really interesting. I've, I've heard someone speak a little bit about that. My assumption, um, you know, from the information that I've gathered is a lot of times when we see issues with estrogen in women, it could be a, a clearance issue. So when we look at Hashimoto's, mm -hmm. high estrogen, what's usually in the middle of that GI disorder. Mm -hmm. um, so we're unable to kind of process and eliminate toxins. Potentially mm -hmm. that could cause issues with methylation. It's like you're saying, it's all of the things kind of together, but it creates that perfect environment for dysfunction. Yeah. When so, and so estrogen, like growth hormone is sexually dimorphic too. So like some of the things I'm saying are more male specific. So estrogen in, in a different place might do different things in females than it's going to do for males. <clears throat> um, but you do see digestion stuff with men when they crush their estrogen, right? It stops bile production. And you see that in women when they're postmenopausal, they can't eat anymore, right? Their stomach gets distended. I got a question for you because we were talking about it quickly. Uh, you know, we were talking about estrogen, estrogens having a uh, propensity to help with glycogen uptake, glycogen storage. What are your thoughts? Because I've done both. Why do some coaches crush estrogen on peak week and then uh, try to fill out or sometimes not crush estrogen to uh, help load? Because I hear different coaches having different ways of doing peaks. Some people may try to pull water with an ARB, something like that. And as I hear other coaches reducing water with some sort of um, uh, estrogen blocking medication, estrogen or uh, anti-estrogen drug. Curious on where you stand on that with your coaching philosophy. I'm more, I'm probably more old fashioned in my, my technique, what was working 20 years ago still works. It doesn't mean that there aren't other ways to do it. I'm personally not impressed with the conditioning that's brought to stage nowadays, even at the pro level, like I was at the Arnold. I mean, there was a clear winner there. The other guys were not bringing condition. Uh, I would say I typically, I mean, not to give doses, but I typically would run. It's the standard. It's I switched to short esters at eight, at eight weeks out. And the reason being is that I can pull things fast or move them fast. It's not that there's any specific magic property in test propanate versus a longer ester, but I can pull it. I'm always going to pull test on peak week, 99% of the time. There's a rare guy that like really flattens out that I might run it in, but um, I have one guy that I might keep it at 300 in, but like generally it's getting pulled because I don't want inflammation from injections. Um, I've gone back to what I was doing before. It's just Winstrol. It, I don't screw around with Anovar, I don't screw around with Halotestin. Um, it's just Winstrol and I titrate it up relatively high at the end. Uh, I will lower estrogen at the end. Once the test has been pulled though, I'm not gonna run an AI cause that doesn't make any sense at all to me. Like, what are you crushing at that point? There's no conversion. Um, I don't, yes, estrogen does have a role in glycogen storage but I don't think it completely squashes. It's not like you can't store glycogen without it. I would also rather bring an athlete in drier and harder than full and spilled over. And I feel like when the estrogen's high, they tend to look wet not really the look that I'm going for in my guys. Um, and then three days out, I kind of decide what it is. Is there a mineral thing? Is it aldactone? Is it, you know, diathiazide? What, what is, is there a missing thing that's needed? Sometimes it's nothing. 
I want guys to be ready a week out. Like the Sunday before a show, you should be ready to go. It's just a slight variation, but you should be able to win. If you can't win the Sunday before, you're not going to, there's no mat. At least in my book, there's no magic here happening in the last week. Right. There, right? There's absolutely no magic happening in the last week. You're exactly I don't right. Even, I don't think using blood pressure medicine for the wrong purpose is ever the right answer. That's just, I, it's dangerous. You're supposed to have a blood pressure response to stress by blocking when, when, um, aldosterone is not, or, um, um, I can't even talk right now. When when things aren't elevated and you're falsely just holding it down, it's not good for you. And that's not the right way to reduce that water, right? Because what's the cause? It's like, treat the cause. Don't treat, just band-aid other stuff over it. Well, I was always curious too. There is some, I, I heard the secondhand, so it could have been bad information, but there's some secondhand coaches where six weeks out, they were using extremely low amounts of testosterone or even cutting it out two weeks before. But, blasting letrozole every day like starting six weeks it. out and and they have uh, things that don't convert to estrogen in their protocol like extremely large amounts of it and then there's other things that also help lower you know if it's like a masteron or whatever um i didn't i just never understood it and just the comment was and it goes back to the doctor thing we we're talking about earlier the coach was like that's just what you gotta do if you want to be dried out if you want your glutes to come in i'm like yeah, I need a little better explanation than that. <laughs> well, first of all, I don't know how many judges actually care about your glutes. I know everyone obsesses about this. I don't think anyone's ever lost a show because their glutes were. I'm a glute obsessor. I'm like, no, but I don't think the judges, <laughs> don't, the judges look at the whole package. I don't think like the glutes are making or breaking anything. Sorry, Rich Gasperi. Uh, the I don't know. I do I, the whole new thing with the guys with the the low test and the two grams of Masteron. I'm not sure where the. I would never use more than 800 milligrams of Masteron for anyone. I think at that point, use something efficient. What are you doing? With that drug it's like everyone's running low test high primo high masteron into a show and it just with no ai it just seems like completely backwards not that it can't work i'm sure that there's guys out there uh that it might work for but that does as a general formula it's just not something i would i'm not putting someone's money on that one yeah it's just not the way i would run someone and i see i've seen more people and justin because you said you work with a lot of women as well the amount of coaches and women doing it to themselves, crushing estrogen intentionally their peak weeks. And I warn my athletes, it's, I, I, you know, I do the same. I, we switch to a probe and then we pull it. And at that point, you know, you don't really have that estrogen source. So yeah, yeah your estrogen is going to be low. It's kind of crash peak week. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. I explain that. And it's only for a week and it's not like we don't take immediate corrective action. It's literally just a week. It's not like we're doing that the whole prep. We're not demonizing estrogen. It's the results of ensuring lack of water retention from injections or any issues at injection sites. But the women, how many women are taking multiple AIs and SERMs on their peak week? And they're just not conditioned in their coaches. So we got to dry you out more. And I'm like, you can't dry out fat. Oh, right. Fat doesn't dry. <laughs> no. And that's, the, that's like when guys overuse diuretics, right? Right. Like it shouldn't I'm just, be. I'm just holding right. water, man. I like, just got to get the water out. If there's a mistake that was made, you could perhaps can clean it up a little bit, but like that should be looked at as that, not as a mandatory thing. You can correct most things oh. with just minerals. So go, going back yeah. to sodium and potassium, it's like, do you, I, do I like a diuretic? Hell yeah, I like a diuretic. Of course I do. But sometimes you don't, you don't need a diuretic. No. Like I, I think a lot of times it's just like that dogma of like, hey, that half a diazide cheeseburger, that's just how you come in dry. I'm like, well, maybe sometimes it's kind of a gamble. At, it can be a gamble. You know, I've done it both ways. I've done the, um, really clean just kind of stick to your basic foods and load up and then i've done like the trash cheat meal and i will tell you more times than not kind of sticking with the foods that work with your digestive system yeah. tend to work better you know i think i tend to look better when i do those things i was gonna say that to me is like the weirdest thing too that never made any sense like the stuff you see people eating backstage you're like you've been on a diet for 26 weeks you've had nothing but rice you're now gonna eat cheese like is or, or ground beef that you got in a restaurant you don't know how it was cooked what it was cooked in what the fat content, you think your body's going to digest that? Now you got no estrogen either. So you don't have any bile. You're going to put that in your stomach and then go on stage. I mean, You're bloated. Oh, dude, All your lines are gone. You look like a bag of water. <laughs> so go on stage. Yeah. I, yeah. And then not to mention like the issue for cramping, like that's the absolute worst. It just, oh, it's, uh, I had it happen uh, once and, uh, 
I was not doing anything extreme and still had it happen. And that was frustrating as all hell, like all that work. And I'm like doing this with my leg. I'm like, I'm like, okay, I'm just not going to flex my leg while I'm standing here for five minutes in a comparison. I'm like, this is great. This is really fun. But um, yeah. I mean, I'll pull fat burners out the last week too. Cause that'll screw up. Oh, of course. You know, too. But like some guys will try to run them all the way in. And I've done it myself too. I've tried to run stimulants because you're exhausted on peak week and you never fill out, right? Like your weight keeps dropping. Like those are the shows you get on the scut way in and then you another hour later you're lighter and you keep like you can't control it. It's like add up like your weight is just plummeting the whole day. I even see that with thyroid medication. Is that that's used too long? And I'm hypothyroid. I do take thyroid medication. But I tend to have to pull back a little bit as I'm filling out um, because I think I'm just in my metabolism is so high in general. Uh, at that last part of peak week, I have to pull back a little bit on my thyroid medication for me to fill out. Um, question, because we were talking about sex hormone binding globulin and everybody's obsession with it. <laughs> uh, the something that i found really interesting and this is just from my own findings there's no clinical research on this but i've looked at a uh not a lot maybe 10 people who were animal or i'm sorry plant-based diets and their sex hormone binding globulin always tends to be much higher and i'm curious if animal proteins play a role in reduction of sex hormone binding globulin probably phytoestrogens in the plants probably the opposite soy based right? because soy would do it so Sex hormone binding globulin tends to go up with estrogen and down as estrogen goes down as well. So it's probably that or fiber. It could be lots of things, but it mostly it's the soy. It's really interesting because I will see sometimes they'll have like a total testosterone of seven or 800 and then a free testosterone of five and an SHBG of 80. Um, and at oh. one time in a clinical setting, we were doing you know, five, 10 milligrams of oxandrolone to kind of reduce that. It does seem to do a nice job oh. of reducing SHBG. Um, but uh, was curious if you've ever seen anything like that. Not personally, but I'm my immediate like would be the effect of that it's soy or, or plant based proteins with phytoestrogens. Interesting. Doesn't mean there's anything wrong with them. It's just going to raise like if the body thinks yeah. that it's going to raise that. I don't know if you guys have have seen it. I'm on like a lot of the short form content platforms, unfortunately. But there is a a very popular uh, nationwide. Helamet clinic and 99% of the content that they produce is about SHBG and they have kind of made it their, their brand identity that they prescribe their HRT protocols around SHBG values. So I think a lot of that interest and concern and obsession with SHBG comes from that specific clinic because they are viral videos with millions of views, right. lots of traction. And they basically say like, we can diagnose any health issue or medical problem that you've ever had in your entire life based on SHBG. And they're also big believers in not utilizing aromatase inhibitors, regardless of genetic predispositions and numbers. And they're so set on that, they do not pull estradiol even upon patient requests. So I think a lot of that <laughs> information is coming from that content because it, it is, is rampant. What, what are they claiming? What, first of all, the fact that they claim that they can cure any disease by looking at sex from a binding glob is like... Yeah. It's just a binding no, protein. It's actually a crime. <laughs> I believe to say that. I don't think you can actually say that. Um, the what are they trying to do? Lower your sex hormone binding globin? Like, what is their goal? I don't know. I, well, I, I understand. Like, when it's really low, you just excrete hormones faster. So you don't really want it really low. When it's really high, things are bound. But sex hormone binding globin is not as firmly, depending on what you're binding it to, testosterone and estrogen. They can still work to some degree. And sex hormone binding globin itself has a receptor. The only time it's totally useless is with DHT. Then the sex hormone binding globulin and the DHT are totally useless. But like, I, I don't know why people even pay attention to it. You had mentioned uh, earlier people blaming bl blaming their um, erectile dysfunction on it. And that was one of their key videos that really got into circulation is, hey, if you have ED issues, there's no way it's estrogen related. No it's way. a direct result definitely. of your SHBG being out of range. Definitely not. I, I do think looking at SHBG has a couple useful things. I think like at least from like free mm -hmm. free forms of thyroid. So sometimes if someone has a really high SHBG, we may see 
free T4, T, free T3 being bound in that form. Um, so that may be some like application and lowering that for that specific thing, maybe in a natural individual who wants more free testosterone, but outside of that, not really in P PCOS, we probably PCOS want for sure. Yeah. We want SHVG high enough. So you're not growing a beard. I don't know many women who look good with the beard or no hair on their head, but other than that, I just don't really see it being extremely helpful. There's yeah. a particular YouTube channel where they, uh, that was very popular a year year or two ago where they would really talk a lot about optimal ranges for shbg there's a lot that goes into gen genetics with shbg too not everybody is going to fit within mm -hmm. this quote unquote range some people genetically may have lower levels of binding protein so i think it just depends on the individual and what type of symptoms yeah. they have but it's not an end-all be-all i no, i know it has tons, it has value to look at for sure i just meant i would i don't like obsessing about that specifically no. i'd rather figure out why it's moved if that's even the issue but I, when companies like that make these statements it's like and where did they learn that in school like where is that printed anywhere that like you know i'm not into censorship at all but i think at some point perhaps the fda needs to step in and start looking at some of these statements like that's think about that like if i said that i get sued like you i can't say those things how do you right. make a statement like that you say like, and you do hear social influencers say it that clearly they're not doctors, but they say things like, oh, I can cure this or that. Who the F ever says that about any disease? Why would you ever say that? Have you, uh, any of you have seen the uh, the detox dude, the guy who claims he can clear all? Oh, it's just because I, uh, I like a lot of cleanses and binders. I think they serve a purpose, like if we're looking at functional health, but there's this guy, he's called the detox dude. And you know, he's saying that all everything that we put in our body is the reason why we have so much dysfunction. And he has like this cleanse that's like, uh, I don't know, it's like a liver cleanse, uh, gut cleanse, colon cleanse, and where you're doing enemas and other types of things. And I'm just like, that seems really like far out there to look at for uh, trying to cure some sort of ailment uh, versus, you know, kind of looking at traditional things. And then if you want to check for a parasite or check for heavy metals, yeah, you can, but you kind of want to look at baseline lab markers before going to the extremes and do a parasite cleanse. That, that stuff just kind of blows my mind. When the bottom line is we don't know the answer to a lot of these things, like how to fix these. I had to do a project in school on cancer once, and I met with a physician I won't say anything that gives away. He's seen over a million cases of different cancer in his in his career. He's seen probably more cancer than anyone else on the planet. And he just flat out was like, if we knew what caused cancer, we would have a cure for cancer. Like you can't say these silly things. Like it cures all these diseases. How the heck can anyone say that? Like it's some of these things are just like it's it's negligent to say things like that. Like, well, do you I remember, the, most... I, I've said it before online, there was a guy, I'm, I might miss tell the story, but the guy who did the alkaline diet, yeah, he ended up killing like 16 people. He told them to stop their chemotherapy and put baking soda in IVs and that would get rid of their cancer and they all died. That's a real you, thing that happened? You can find the video of his court case, I think is on YouTube somewhere. And he was sentenced to a long jail sentence and a huge fine. And during the, when the, after his sentencing, the judge asked him, again, I'm not telling it word for word. The judge basically asked if he had any remarks on his sentencing. And he was like, I think that's an awfully harsh sentence. And the judge was like, you killed 16 people. He's like, you have a high school diploma. What gave you the right to tell people with cancer what to do with their medication? I mean, that's the moral of the story is like, maybe people need to stop doing that sort of stuff. Like, what's the benefit? Are you actually helping anyone by making up stuff? Monetary exchange, that's the issue with like, social media now. Is money that important that it's worth harming people over? Yeah, it's crazy, I mean, honestly. You and I talked about that when the halo testing craze from a couple months. It's like, it's so ridiculous. Like, stop making shit up. I will I like say I'm, I'm no longer getting people asking if they can just take halo in lieu of HRT now. <laughs> <laughs> that trend, hopefully, that trend is gone, I think, already. <laughs> But I liked what you said earlier about really like leaning into Winstrol for uh, peak week or leading up into a show. That's honestly my favorite drug. I think that it, it's that very look, like, right? yeah, it has the look. It, some it's people, so they're a little flat, maybe some super draw, maybe, but maybe Winstrol, Winstrol more times than not, it's, it's all you need. Yeah, dude, it's, like, it's my favorite. And it's four weeks. You push it a little higher than you're used to and you, you get the look, assuming they're lean enough. That's the key, right? If they're not lean enough, they're not going to do anything.
give fat people that, insulin all day long. It's not going to do anything. But oh, you know, I've seen it. You know, <laughs> but that's it's going to dry you up. Just wait. Like, like, like I, be shredded. I, I would rather if I had to pick, I would rather Winstrol than Tren. From a psychological prep is basically to hold your tissue when you're extremely dieting. Assuming you take an appropriate amount of time for prep, you might not even need Tren. Like it's a I tool you need to wash something. In 21 without trend, and I look great, you know. I, I think like can you can you use it? Sure, but I will tell you my everybody around me doesn't like it when I use trend. So why use trend yeah. if I can get something very similar from using menstrual? Trend has caused more problems in my marriage than anything else. But me on trend, not trend itself, not the bottle. Yeah. But no, never I, the bottle. It wasn't like the bottle threw itself at her or something. <laughs> Yeah, I don't have any uh, really any experiences with that. Gratefully, so I'm still. I don't think I'd be married, and yeah, I'd stay away. It's maybe throw me away. So. It's a that when I talk to athletes that maybe have taken trend and plan, maybe they're a candidate and they want to take it again. That's a big part of our conversation. And sometimes I'll get on a call with them and their spouses, and we kind of have a group discussion on that. Because I mean, you can't just take compounds because you just want to. I was like, you have a you have a family, and there's mm -hmm. other considerations. Like you're not headed to the IFBB stage anytime soon. Like let's make sure we don't end up in divorce because of this yeah. local show kind of thing. So we always encourage people to talk to their spouses about compounds and see what their spouses may be comfortable with as well. Because we want to value our family's opinions and sometimes that goes over really well and other times not so much and i think again easier said than done sometimes but all of us have dieted at one point or another if you just work a little harder you don't need as many drugs like i hate oh, to say that sure. but like that's something that like i'm i'm good friends with aj and that's something that like i've picked up from him is like maybe i just need to work harder you make a good point. I was talking with my fiance yesterday and I have an athlete who's just obsessed with sticking himself, you know, doing injections. And I'm like, if he would focus that same energy on his nutrition and his training and his sleep, he would realize that that's a small part of the week. That's 10 minutes out of the week, five minutes out of the week to prepare that, to shoot that. That's yeah. not going to give you that final uh, result that you want. It's all of those other little things that really matter. The drugs help, no doubt, but if you can't can't stick to your diet and you sleep four hours a night, you can shoot all the testosterone you want. Unless you're a genetic anomaly, you're not going to respond. No. And and if you were a genetic anomaly, you would know you were one. It's not like a, you just stumble upon it one day. You you knew since you were undercover. 12. You 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 knew you were flex wheeler when you were twelve. Someone you know you were the biggest dude in the gym. I think the problem with things like trend is it doesn't teach people to diet correctly because it allows you that leeway. And that's how guys use it. And what it doesn't mean I'm any better or different than anyone because I've done the same stupid shit. I'm just saying that's the problem with it is it doesn't teach you to, to work harder. It teaches you to shortcut things. Right? And then when the, when you're not ready for a show, then what do you do? Because now you have no work ethic. Right? Yeah. And perhaps just stay leaner all year round. Agreed with that, honestly. Yeah. I feel yeah. like you grow way better. Well, that was the the one of the obstacles on top of that when I dieted with Justin almost three years ago now. I did a show and couldn't take any fat burners really. Had to keep my caffeine was like 200 micrograms a day. was like as high as I can go because I, it's benign luckily, but I have a, um, PVCs and, you know, they were kind of elevated a little bit. So the doc was like, stay away from any you know, caffeine, blah, blah. Now I know how to manage it and then I can push it a little more and it's still low, but it was just like, that sucked. <laughs> you want to talk about like, I mean, for my frame, like the amount energy. of food he had to cut and just barely picking my feet up to, for all the damn cardio I had to do. So, cause genetically I can get very strong, very big, pretty easy. I've never had a problem with that, but when it comes to, when it comes to the dieting part, it definitely, luckily I have the, uh, the psychotic work ethic, but if it wasn't for that, there's no way I would ever be able to get down. <laughs> it's funny how that tends to be two different people, right? Very rarely do you get someone who's both. Right. Like that's would be like a Mr. Olympia tends, right? right? Like I can always get shredded. I'm pretty much shredded all year round. That's not a big deal for me. It takes a lot more effort for me to get bigger. Like I really have to eat and really push myself, but like getting lean, I can do, I like, I'll say- You're like a bottomless pit. What, yeah, and I can eat like I can diet on a lot of food, but it's just funny because I have a couple guys that are a couple weeks out, and one of them is behind. And I was like, You're behind where we need to be. And he's like, No, I think I look pretty good. And I was like, I'm 50 years old and I'm not dieting for a show, and I'm leaner than you right now. And I sent him a picture. He's like, Oh, 
yeah, you need to be in better shape to get on stage. We're not we're not getting on stage looking like that. Right. Yeah, your coach is always gonna know the best too. Cause don't don't take your own eyes for it, right? Your eyes are gonna play tricks. I think you look better or well, worse. Yeah, it's everyone losing their mind at four weeks out. I don't know if you guys see the same you thing. You cannot view yourself objectively. Four weeks out is like when people lose their mind. They're like, they're either second guessing everything. It's like, is it more cardio? Should I have another 45 minutes of cardio? I'm already doing four hours. Or should I eat? What if I cut my calories down to 400 calories? That'll work, right? More if you're so. already, if you're in bodybuilding, you're going to be dysmorphic to some degree anyway. So you're going to think that you look awful yeah. no matter what, and you're skinny and terrible, or you're going to think you look way better than what you could ever dream of looking. Like you're going to be dysmorphic to some degree if you're interested in bodybuilding. And everyone on show understand. day is going to know what you're, what you were thinking four weeks ago. Cause you got the, the, ch the puffy chubby guy that <laughs> clearly thought he was a lot leaner than he was. Then you have the other guy where you're like, that dude looks like death. <laughs> so. I never understand the latter of someone who's going to show. They're like, I look great. And I'm like, dude, like you're not ready. Like I, it's like how I always think that's interesting when you put someone on a diet and you know how much they're eating, you're getting their biofeedback and they're not losing any weight. They're not losing any body fat. They're like, I don't know. I'm doing everything right. I'm like, you're clearly not doing one of the pieces. I'm like, you know, you're eating in a restrictive state. You're doing cardio drugs are in place and you're not losing any body fat. That always blows my mind. I'm like, to that clients think you're that dumb is like, I don't know. I dropped a client working. for that. Maybe, maybe a month ago, I dropped a client for that. And I was like, at the end of the day, you are a representation of my work. And at, at one point they pulled from the show for mental health, decided to go back into a prep like a week later after food spiked, cardio, sharp reduction. So I'm like, this is mental health. Like this has to be taken seriously. And then they demanded to do a show date. I'm like, that is 1000% not feasible. At least I'm not putting my name on that will not do that. And that's where you really have to trust your coach because you are not going to be able to gauge yourself objectively in any yeah. capacity. And you can't trick us. If we pull food and add cardio, like science is science, there's there's going to be an answer, especially if we're pulling blood work. Like there's nothing that's going to get past us. Yeah. And thermodynamics is thermodynamics. If you're not losing Dude. weight, you're eating too much. You're not <laughs> doing cardio. Like, you can't fool physics, right? I'm sure Justin would love if we could somehow outdo thermodynamics, but unfortunately, <laughs> If he can't figure that out, I don't think I can figure that out. He would he would love to discuss it with people. I'm sure that say they can. <laughs> uh, did you send me a picture, Kurt? Yeah, that was just my current. So like the guy was like, it was like a bad selfie, but just I was trying to show him that like that's five meals in. I'm not dieting and I'm 50 and he wasn't ready to be in a show. And I'm bigger than him. Yeah, probably. Good. Good. Uh, Good way to get his attention. Right? Bert, we need to get you a full size mirror. I know. I don't think I've ever seen a full oh, mirror full picture. Yeah, I know. Why don't you get my wife to take a picture of me sometimes? Well, we'll uh, we're we're getting gift ideas for you, Kurt. We're gonna we're gonna look up your birthday, and if not, <laughs> it's holiday December time. December thirtieth. Uh, December thirtieth. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you're do you, did you get screwed a lot out of Christmas gifts, or did you get double? I was an only child, so you got. I was so rough that my parents did not want more. <laughs> <laughs> all right well uh i think we'll we'll wrap on that i know we got a lot we unpacked i know um i gotta list some other questions for the next one sure uh talks on gut health i know there's some mental health stuff that mike catherwood uh brought up before we'll try to get some more details on that and um yeah plenty plenty more to come Thanks so much for joining. Any closing thoughts? We'll start with you, DJ. Anything else you want to add or maybe future topics or anything come to mind? I feel like we we strayed from the blood work a lot, but I think we covered some good ground. And I'm sorry I progressively got wider as we filmed. <laughs> all good. All good. Justin, anything else from you? No, I think uh, I agree with DJ. We should go a little deeper uh, on further episodes on blood work. I love that stuff. So nerd out on that for sure. That's my fault. I think I went off on estrogen six times. <laughs> I no, need some we'll, ADHD. That's the blood work. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep it rolling. But for everybody out there, keep the comments coming, uh, the questions, share this with your friends. You know, the more subscribers we get, the more feedback we get, the better content we can produce. So, and as you guys see, people are jumping on, uh, taking time out of their day just to add value to everybody else out there who's listening. So we definitely appreciate it. And thanks so much, everybody, for joining. Thank we'll see you. you. Thank you.